Good morning. Today we are reading Tuesdays with Maury by Mitch Album. This is the 10th anniversary edition. We are on page 73, The Professor, if you're following along in the book. And we are making book brain or heart connections today. If you make a book connection, you are summarizing uh, what the author is presenting in the chapter. If you make a brain connection, it is your learning is confirmed or challenged or something appeals to you intellectually. If we make a heart connection, we are connecting with the story on a deeper level and thinking about how it might be changing us to be better. The professor. He was eight years old. A telegram came from the hospital, and since his father, a Russian immigrant, could not read English, Maury had to break the news, reading his mother's death notice like a student in front of the class. We regret to inform you, he began. On the morning of the funeral, Maury's relatives came down the steps of his tenement building on the poor Lower East Side of Manhattan. The men wore dark suits, the women wore veils, the kids in the neighborhood were going off to school, and as they passed, Maury looked down, ashamed that his classmates would see him this way. One of his aunts, a heavy set woman, grabbed Maury and began to wail, What will you do without your mother? What will become of you? Maury burst into tears, and his classmates ran away. At the cemetery, Maury watched as they shoveled dirt into his mother's grave. He tried to recall the tender moments they had shared when she was alive. She had operated a candy store until he got sick, after which she mostly slept or sat by the window, looking frail and weak. Sometimes she would yell out for her son to get her some medicine, and young Maury, playing stickball in the street, would pretend he did not hear her. <clears throat> in his mind, he believed he could make the illness go away by ignoring it. How else can a child confront death? Maury's father, whom everyone called Charlie, had come to America to escape the Russian army. He worked in the fur business but was constantly out of a job. Uneducated and barely able to speak English, he was terribly poor and the family was on public assistance much of the time. Their apartment was a dark, cramped, depressing place behind the candy store. They had no luxuries, no car. Sometimes to make money, Maury and his younger brother, David, would wash porch steps together for a nickel. After their mother's death, the two boys were sent off to a small hotel in the Connecticut woods where several families shared a large cabin and a communal kitchen. The fresh air might be good for the children, the relatives thought. Maury and David had never seen so much greenery. They ran and played in the fields. One night after dinner, they went for a walk and it began to rain. Rather than come inside, they splashed around for hours. The next morning, when they awoke, Maury hopped out of bed. Come on, he said to his brother. Get up. I can't. What do you mean? David's face was panicked. I can't. Move. He had polio. Of course, the rain did not cause this, but a child Maury's age could not understand that. For a long time, as his brother was taken back and forth to a special medical home and was forced to wear braces on his legs, which left him limping, Maury felt responsible. So in the mornings, he went to synagogue by himself because his father was not a religious man and he stood among the swaying men in their long black coats and he asked God to take care of his dead mother and his sick brother. And in the afternoons, he stood at the bottom of the subway steps and hawked magazines, turning whatever money he made over to his family to buy food. In the evenings, he watched his father eat in silence, hoping for, but never getting, a show of affection, communication, warmth. At nine years old, he felt as if the weight of a mountain were on his shoulders. But a saving embrace came into Maury's life the following year, his new stepmother, Eva. 
She was a short Romanian immigrant with plain features, curly brown hair, and the energy of two women. She had a glow that warmed the otherwise murky atmosphere his father created. She talked when her new husband was silent. She sang songs to the children at night. Maury took comfort in her soothing voice, her school lessons, her strong character. When his brother returned from the medical home, still wearing leg braces from polio, the two of them shared a rollaway bed in the kitchen of their apartment, and Eva would kiss them goodnight. <coughs> Maury waited on those kisses like a puppy waits on milk, and he felt deep down that he had a mother again. There was no escaping their poverty, however. They lived in the Bronx in a one-bedroom apartment in a red brick building on Tremont Avenue, next to an Italian beer garden where the old men played bocce on summer evenings. Because of the Depression, Maury's father found even less work in the fur business. Sometimes when the family sat at the dinner table, all Eva could put out was bread. What else is there? David would ask. Nothing else she would answer. When she tucked Maury and David into bed, she would sing to them in Yiddish. Even the songs were sad and poor. There was one about a girl trying to sell her cigarettes. Please buy my cigarettes, they are dry, not wet by rain. Take pity on me, take pity on me. Still, despite their circumstances, Maury was taught to love and to care and to learn. Eva would accept nothing less than excellence in school because she saw education as the only antidote to their poverty. She herself went to night school to improve her English. Maury's love for education was hatched in her arms. He studied at night by the lamp at the kitchen table, and in the mornings he would go to synagogue to say its core, the memorial prayer for the dead, for his mother. He did this to keep her memory alive. Incredibly, Maury had been told by his father never to talk about her. Charlie wanted young David to think Eva was a na his natural mother. Oh, it was a terrible burden to Maury. For years, the only evidence Maury had of his mother was the telegram announcing her death. He had hidden it the day it arrived, and he would keep it the rest of his life. When Maury was a teenager, his father took him to the fur factory where he worked. This was during the Depression. The idea was to get Maury a job. He entered the factory and immediately felt as if the walls had closed in around him. The room was dark and hot, the windows covered with filth, and the machines were packed tightly together churning like train wheels and the fur hairs were flying creating a thickening air and the workers sewing the pelts together were bent over their needles as the boss marched up and down the rows screaming for them to go faster. Maury could barely breathe. He stood next to his father frozen with fear hoping the boss wouldn't scream at him too. During lunch break his father took Maury to the boss and pushed him in front of him, asking if there was any work for his son. But there was barely enough work for the adult laborers, and no one was giving it up. This, for Maury, was a blessing. He hated the place. He made another vow that he kept to the end of his life. He would never do any work that exploited someone else. And he would never allow himself to make money off the sweat of others. What will you do? Eva would ask him. I don't know, he would say. He ruled out law because he didn't like lawyers and he ruled out medicine because he couldn't take the sight of blood. What will you do? It was only through default that the best professor I ever had became a teacher. So here's that moment where you stop the video and you make that book, that brain, or that heart connection. I'll see you back in a moment. For me, I made a, um, I made a, a heart connection 
by the phrase that says Maury's love for education was hatched in Eva's arms. This really meant a lot to me because um, I was so happy that Maury had a second chance to, to be mothered by someone who was so loving. But the, um, the thing that really ch it changed me here, or con it's sort of both a book and a brain heart connection. I mean, a book, a brain and a heart connection because I'm, it just confirms what I believe about how education can change a person for the better and how you have if you have that one right person in your life they 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 fan that flame for learning and I myself have had that person in my life my high school English teacher Mrs. Hoyt is the one who gave me that that desire to to further my education and teach um, I also loved how um, Mitch to chose the word antidote I'm sure Maury was part of that choice, that education, she saw education as the only antidote to their poverty, just the healing balm that a good education can have on a person's life. And at poverty, um, on, on poor, on being financially challenged. Thank you for joining me and I look forward to seeing you back and I look forward to hearing about your book brain or heart connections. Have a beautiful day.